Good morning. Happy Friday. Nice to have you all here. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, today, what we're going to do, <coughs> excuse me, in lab, you'll turn in the acid and base titrations lab from last week. Prompts that number five is up, and we'll do the lab with the longest name, uh, determination of KSP, delta G, delta H, and delta S for calcium hydroxide. Uh, experimentally, it doesn't, it's not too terribly long. Uh, the write-up, there's a little bit of stuff to do, but it shouldn't be too bad. That's the goal for today. And you can see there isn't a quiz on the list for today. Uh, we have, we're having a take-home quiz this time around. And how this is going to work, first of all, Monday is Memorial Day, so now it will be totally closed. We won't have a lecture or anything like that. But via email, you will get a link to take home quiz number five and print it out. Uh, if you have to wait till Tuesday, that's cool too. Uh, but make sure you have a printed copy, fill it out, and you'll turn it in on Wednesday. And for everybody but Kaitlin here, uh, you do have to come to lecture next Wednesday. All right? Usually it's like whatever, all right, to me, but, but this is one time where I do want you to go. And you'll turn in the quiz to me. Uh, so 9, 9 a.m. to 13.03. The web-based section will be Wednesday as well. It'll just be a 110. So take home quiz five release Monday, to turn it in on Wednesday. And then next week, Friday, we'll take the second midterm. Uh, exam prep two will be due. We'll turn in the KSP lab we're gonna do in lab today. We're getting down to the end. Uh, one piece of light through the tunnel is that the lab we're gonna do next Friday is what I call QA1. And Q stands for qualitative, qualitative analysis of group one ions. And people usually find it's pretty fun, <laughs> all right? Now, at this point, you know, believe me or not, I understand, but uh, usually people find it's pretty cool. Um, there's a lot of chemicals to add. There's zero math, which maybe is kind of nice. Um, when you come next Friday, and I'll say this more next week, but please don't wear open-toed shoes. The weather's nice. Uh, if you have some kind of closed-toed shoes, I don't see anybody in here wearing open-toed shoes, but don't wear sandals that day. Once in a while, I've had people spill chemicals and stuff like that. If you have your safety goggles, those would be cool to bring. Any questions on any of that? Yeah, John. That is the quiz that would have been like today. Yeah, okay. right on. Um, John, giving everybody a little bit extra time to kind of process the information. Mm -hmm. And um, so hopefully this is a cool thing. So Monday, early in the morning, I'll send the link out and then turn it in Wednesday. Okay. Other questions? That's a cool question. So the lab will just start early during that time then? Yeah, um, I was telling them earlier that sometimes in prompts at five, people ask a lot of questions, all right? Awesome, all right, bring them on. On the other hand, it is the end of the term. And so if nobody asks any questions, yeah, then we'll start the lab earlier, you bet. So, so I'm, I'm there for you if you want it, but if you don't want it, which I understand, we'll, we'll go for it. Eight talks a lot, so just joking, thinking about eight. Okay, good. We left off with this example on Wednesday, and I want to go through it one more time just to make sure. There's two more really important parts I want to talk about today, and this is the first one. This is quantitative aspects of electrochemistry. Quantity means how much, all right? And in this kind of a problem, we're using electricity to make some kind of transformation possible, all right? In this example, this is actually a reaction that's used in a battery. And I'll talk in a little bit about how, man, you know, don't just throw your batteries in the woods and stuff. Uh, there's a lot of heavy chemicals that leach out of them, and they can be pretty bad. In this type of battery, uh, which is used apparently in car batteries a lot, lead turns to lead 2 plus, all right? But the stuff then that sometimes leaches out can be very acidic, and that's bad for the environment. And of course, when the acid leaches out, you're going to have lead leach out, and lead isn't good either, blah, blah, blah. But that's really not so important in this problem. What we're after is we want a battery that delivers 1.50 amps of current. And if we have a pound, which is 454 grams of lead, it'd be nice to know like how long this battery is going to last. And so what we did at the end on Wednesday, uh, first we turned grams of lead into moles of lead. So you look on the periodic table, lead is about 207, 207.2 grams per mole. 
So 454 divided by that number would give you 2.19 volts. Now this is the part I've had some questions on. Uh, most of these reactions, there will be some kind of ratio between what you're starting with and what you're ending with. And this is a lead to plus here. Um, it has lost two electrons. You can also see that it's lost two electrons because in the half reaction, which can show electrons, you see the two electrons. So what that means is that every lead gives up two electrons, all right? There'll be some kind of conversion like that. Uh, we saw another example on Wednesday that I think was silver plus to silver. <clears throat> that was a one-to-one -one ratio. But sometimes you have different ratios than one-to-one, -one, so just FYI. So for this problem, what that means is 2.19 moles of lead times two means we have 4.38 moles of electrons running around. And that's important because as we talked about, and we'll see on the next slide, the amps equal coulombs per second, all right? And in this case then, <clears throat> we're gonna get coulombs down here in a second. We can use the moles of electrons to figure out how many coulombs there are. So the new constant that we talked about on Wednesday is the Faraday constant. Faraday named after Michael Faraday, the electrochemist. Faraday's constant's one you'll need to know slash memorize. 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons, all right? So we can take the moles of electrons, multiply it by the Faraday constant, and that'll give us how many coulombs of charge we have in this particular now, once you have coulombs, remember that an amp is a coulomb per second. So you, if you see on any of my problems anyway, an amp, you can just cross out the big A and put in coulombs per second to make sure that you understand what's going on. Because that's what we'll need. Uh, time, which is what we're after in this problem, is basically coulombs divided by amps or coulombs divided by coulombs per second. Um, I, we talked about, is the symbol in physics for current, and it doesn't really make that much of a difference, but if you see it, that's where it is. The important part, if you see an amp, just make it coulombs per second, and the units will cancel out. So we've got 423,000 coulombs. There's 1.50 coulombs per second. So coulombs divided by coulombs are, are out of here. 1 over 1 over seconds gives you seconds. We're going to have 282,000 seconds of current. Uh, you divide it by 60 twice and you'll get 78.3 hours. So this particular battery should last up 78.3 hours. And of course, if you were relying on this battery, you should go like 50 hours and then make sure you're back somewhere safe so your battery doesn't die. Make sure all the calculations are right. Any questions? Okay. We did this on Wednesday too, but let's go through it one more time. This is a reaction where we're turning gold three plus ions into gold metal, all right? Now, before we go any farther, how many electrons are gonna be transferred per mole of gold made? Three, good, that's right. Three moles of electrons per mole of gold, all right? And in this problem, we have 0 0.0100 moles of gold 3 plus. We're using this weird current, but remember, just cross out the amps, or A, as it sometimes is seen, and write coulombs per second there. And we want to know how long it's going to take. It would be nice to have all the time in the world. James Bond! Oh, sorry, I have all kinds of cheesy references. In this problem, though, it's 1,450 seconds. Now, how you can do that? Here's the moles. Three moles of electrons per mole of gold three converted. So we have this many moles of electrons. The Faraday constant, so important, 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons. So the mole of electrons times the F will give you coulombs. And then the amp, you can just rewrite as coulombs per second. So we'll divide here by the coulombs per second, 1450 seconds.
The last thing we need to look at is something called the Nernst equation. Now, everything else we've looked at so far up to this point has been cell potentials under standard conditions. And that means 298 Kelvin, one mole per liter. If you have a gas, it's one atmosphere of pressure. And that's nice if you are exactly at those conditions. But if you're not at those conditions, the Nernst equation is going to be your good friend. Now, the Nernst equation isn't the most friendly equation looking in the world, but it is totally doable. Nernst equation, E0 is the cell potential under standard conditions. So in problem set five, there's a list of redox potentials. Those are all E0 values. They're what you would see under normal conditions. So you figure out the E0 first, then minus RT, NF, LN, Q. R is 8.3145, it's the energy gas constant. T is the Kelvin temperature. Uh, F is our good friend, the Faraday constant, 96,485. N is the moles of electrons transferred, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. And then finally then, this Q, Q is the same thing we saw in the equilibrium chapter. Q and K look the same. It's products over reactants. And if you have different stoichiometries, you multiply them and stuff like that. I'll talk about that too in a little bit. So this crazy thing, which is kind of an ugly equation, is actually super helpful because maybe like Clifford is using an older battery and he doesn't have like one mole per liter for all of his ions. Maybe he's down to 0.1 moles per liter. Well, he can plug in those values into the Q part. Uh, that's how that's taken care of. On the other hand, maybe Aiden is working in the North Pole on some reaction, I don't know, or, you know, Death Valley, or I don't know if you're more of a hot or a cold person. But anyway, if he's not at 25 degrees Celsius slash 298 Kelvin, the temperature term right there is also a factor that can affect things. And all of these parts play a factor in determining the overall cell potential. So cell potentials under standard conditions are not always cell potential under non-standard conditions. So you go to Mars, you go to uh, uh, the Dead Sea, something like that, hot, cold place, all right, or different conditions of ions. The Nernst equation is what you need to use. I'll show an example here in a little bit. Uh, any questions so far? Now, a zinc copper cell shows a potential equal to the standard potential of 1.10 volts when both zinc and copper are in solution at the same concentration. If more copper ion is added to the cathode compartment solution, however, the cell potential increases. Now, in this example, initially you had one mole per liter of copper two plus and zinc two plus. And the copper two plus, by the way, has this kind of cool blue color to it. And assuming this is 25 degrees Celsius, the cell voltage was 1.10 volts. So if you use the cell potentials for this half reaction, that's the number that you would get. But in this example, which is kind of cool, they added more copper two plus. They added more of the blue stuff, all right? Now let's think about this reaction in terms of Le Chatelier's principle and adding copper two plus. So in Le Chatelier's principle, if we add more copper two plus, is that gonna make the reaction shift right, shift left, or do nothing? Right. Right, good. You're gonna see a shift to the products, all right? More products than you had before. So adding copper two plus is gonna boost this reaction to the right. Now we saw the other day how E is related to delta G and delta G is related to K. So more products means more cell potential, all right? You're gonna boost this reaction a little bit better than it was. So if you really want this reaction to kick it, add more copper two plus, that's a reactant, the reaction shifts to the right. It's going to become more product favored, which means cell potential actually changes. Now, what would be the effect, do you think, if you started with a standard condition uh, reaction here at 1.10 volt, and we added a bunch of zinc two plus? Do you think the cell potential would go up like it did here, or go down? Down, well done. 
it's going to go down because zinc 2 plus is a product. And by Le Chatelier's principle, you add products, it's going to shift to the left hand side, it'll be less product favored. So your cell potential would actually go down if you added more zinc 2 plus. So again, Le Chatelier's principle is something we've seen this whole quarter and it still helps you out. All right. Le Chatelier's principle is truly a gem, in my biased opinion, of course, of Chem 223 because it affects so many things and stuff that I wish I could have talked about in Chem 221 and Chem 222. But anyway. Uh, so, punchline. We added more copper 2 plus, more reactant. Le Chatelier's principle says more product. We would expect more products, less reactants. Bigger K, more product favored, means cell potential goes up. 1.11 volts versus 1.10 volts doesn't seem like a lot, but it is a shift to the product side. So you can actually get more power from your chemical system if you know what you're doing. Any questions on that? Okay, so here's an example actually using the Nernst equation. In this example, we've got zinc 2 plus, we've got hydrogen gas, and a pH of zero. Now, pH of zero means our hydrogen ion concentration, H plus. You could figure that out, 10 to the minus zero, all right, which is one. So we have H plus, H2, and zinc 2 plus, and we have a weird temperature, 290 Kelvin. And the question is, let's find the cell potential E. So this is kind of a beast, but it's totally doable. What we're going to do, we're first going to find the cell potential under standard conditions. So we're going to assume, for example, that zinc 2 plus is one molar. We're going to assume that the temperature is 298 Kelvin. And we'll assume that the pressure of the gas is one atmosphere of pressure. And to find this number, we'll use the cell potentials at the end of problem set five. Well, if you look at this long enough, all right, zinc goes to zinc two plus and two electrons, positive 0.76 volts. And this second reaction is the Xi reaction, the standard hydrogen electrode. And that has a value of zero volts. So in this conditions, all right, what we're going to end up with is a net E value, E naught value of positive 0.76 volts. So this is a reaction that when you connect all the wires, electrons will start flowing. And if everything was standard, we would have an E naught value of positive 0.76 volts. Uh, questions on getting to this number, right? In this reaction, two electrons were generated and two electrons were used up. So the end value here is two, all right? Notice that two electrons cancel two electrons. That's the way to find out that you've got an end value of two. If this would have been like silver going to silver plus plus one electron, we still would have multiplied by two to make the two electrons there cancel. So whatever number that you're canceling out when the oxidized and the redox comes together, that's gonna be the end value right there. Okay, so this is E naught, this is standard condition. This is the value of N. Now we're ready to just look at this Nernst equation a little bit more. Now, the 0.76 volt we just calculated, that's the E naught value. That's the standard conditions, all right? R is 8.3145, the energy R, as I called it, constant, energy gas constant. T is the Kelvin temperature, which here is 290 Kelvin. N is the moles of electrons transferred, which I just said was the two, two moles of electrons go from the zinc to the hydrogen plus ions. F is the Faraday constant, 96,045. And Q, we can now figure out using this reaction. Now remember that Q, just like K, products over reactants. Which of these three species, thanks for playing, which of these four species will not appear in our Q? This song. Solid. Well done. Yeah, solids and liquids, like Kayla said, do not go in Q or K, all right? So we don't have to worry about this, but the other three will definitely be there, okay? So here's 0.76 for E naught minus R, 
the te Kelvin temperature, divide by two, divide by the Faraday, times natural log of Q. Now, we have to have the H plus, we need the zinc two plus, and the H two gas. We can find the H plus, 10 to the minus pH power, 10 to the minus zero is exactly one. So actually the H plus is a standard condition ion, all right? One molar is what people assume uh, when you're using E naught. But the other ones certainly are not. So it's gonna be zinc two plus, times the pressure of the gas, which here is point atmospheres. This is what they call a mixed Q, it's no big deal. And we'll divide it by the hydrogen ion squared, which is just one squared. So this would be the form of Q that goes right there in this reaction. Any questions on that? Sweet. Um, what I usually do on problems like this, the minus RTNF natural log of Q is kind of a mess. So I figure out what that value is separately from E naught. This is just what works for me. You can do what works for you. But anyway, at the end then, the cell potential positive 0.88 volts. So notice how this cell potential did go up. All right, it actually went up quite a bit. And there's different ways to argue why this is, but remembering that in standard conditions, one mole per liter and zinc two plus here is not one mole per liter. And standard conditions for gases, one atmosphere, we are not at standard conditions at H2 gas. So it's almost like uh, these are lower than they should be. And in Le Chatelier's principle, I know you know I'm excited by Le Chatelier's principle, but anyway, it's kind of like those two are too low, all right? You're taking away, if you will, zinc. So the whole reaction should shift to the right. And that's what we see right here, which is kind of cool. Now, temperature is a little lower. That would make the E lower, but the temperature lowering is certainly less than uh, these two and stuff being. So anyway, that's what I would think of when trying to justify why this value is higher than the E naught value that we have. Questions? All right. Um, there's lots of different ways to relate E naught, delta G, and K together. And just as a quick review, all right, we saw that delta G is minus RT natural log of K. We saw delta G equals minus NFE. Well, these are both delta G terms. And so sometimes what people want to do is they want to relate E and K directly, which is totally fine. So you let delta G equal this, which equals this, the negative signs cancel. You end up with E naught equals RT over NF natural log of K, which sometimes people will use. If you happen to be at 298 Kelvin, and that's very standard, of course, uh, R is 8.3145, T would be 298, and the F is 96,045. So once in a while, you'll see this expression out there. This is only for 298 Kelvin, all right? But again, most of the time, that's a pretty safe assumption for these things. Um, it's a quick way to calculate an E naught from an equilibrium constant or vice versa, all right? If you have a uh, cell potential, you can solve for K. Any questions? Okay. Um, this is the triangle. Sometimes people that do a lot of electrochemistry will talk about. Um, I use this one and this one a lot. Honestly, I don't use this one as much, but you can. It's whatever works for you and stuff like that. The minus RTNF and LNK, minus NFE, those are both really helpful. And remember, all of these things, it all comes down to delta G. Delta G is negative, reaction's going to go. Negative delta G's mean that E is going to be positive. So if you want your batteries to work, you'd better have a positive E cell. On the other hand, delta G and K are related. So when delta G is negative, your K will be a number greater than one, product favored. And if delta G is positive, K comes out to be a number less than one, reactive favored. Uh, 
We're going to buzz through some stuff on batteries uh, just because it's so important. Honestly, this stuff is more just informational than anything, but batteries are all around us, and I think I would be negligent to not talk about them a little bit. Because a battery is basically just an electrochemical cell that's self-contained, all right? So in the back of my remote control, in the back of the remote controls you use, uh, that's what you have, all right? And a battery is an example of what's called direct current, so you'll have a positive and a negative. And that's important because electrons will flow from things that are negative to things that are positive. M221, opposites attract, like charges repel. So electrons want to stay away from the negative side and they're attracted to the positive side. So woohoo, next time you look at a battery, it's pretty cool. Anyway, uh, a lot of the batteries we use are pro what are called primary batteries. Those are ones that once the reaction has used up its chemicals, it's dead. Rechargeable batteries are sometimes called secondary batteries. And it's because you can have a reversible reaction. I'll show you some examples. Of course, this field is huge. This is a big area and stuff of research, which is really cool. Um, a lot of the batteries we use are called dry cell batteries, all right, and uh, they're pretty standard. Zinc is involved going to zinc 2 plus, and the other reaction, it's hard to say, but a lot of times it's ammonium going to ammonia. And when you balance these things out, uh, they come down to this right here, which is kind of cool. These are the batteries that usually can't be recharged, all right? They usually have a little bit more power to them, which is nice. In a common dry cell battery, Zinc metal at the anode releases two electrons to form zinc 2 plus ion. These electrons flow to the cathode, a graphite electrode, where ammonium ion is reduced to ammonia and hydrogen gas. The hydrogen gas flows away from the cathode and reduces the surrounding manganese dioxide from the plus 4 to the plus 3 oxidation state. If you throw a battery on the ground that's quote unquote dead, <laughs> all right, I'm, I'm sorry to keep quoting on this, but I am going to anyway, um, you're going to have ammonia, you're going to have this weird manganese. And by the way, that is a weird version of manganese. Manganese is not usually a plus three, but here it is, go figure. Um, you're going to have all kinds of junk going in the environment. So if nothing else from this battery section, you know, throw your batteries away, all right, make sure they're properly disposed of. If you can recycle your battery, rock star all right it used to be a lot easier to recycle batteries but there's difficulties in getting the chemicals out but don't throw them on the ground man they're super super bad when I'm at Fred Myers and I see you know double A's and little pen lights and all these things I'm just like oh, man. anyway all right off my high horse in an alkaline battery zinc metal at the anode releases two electrons to form zinc oxide under basic conditions the two electrons are transported to the cathode, where manganese dioxide is reduced from the plus four to the plus three oxidation state. Hydroxide ions are transported from the cathode region to the anode region of the battery. Again, you've got some really interesting chemistry. Uh, the manganese part alone is really crazy. And these are mostly a lot of the Duracell, uh, those kind of things uh, going on. Uh, these are usually under very strong base conditions. So if you see a battery that's like old and it's got the crusty stuff on it, be really careful. I, I actually really hurt myself one time pulling an old battery out because uh, it had a lot of basic kind of things on it and stuff. So wash your hands after doing it. But, but again, try not to throw a whole thing. Just so then is calling battery acid wrong? Oh, good question. Um, car batteries, we're going to see, do use acid. Absolutely. Uh, these particular ones, Chi, are just in base and stuff. So yeah, so you can have absolutely battery acid, and that's bad for you too. Uh, these would have battery base, I guess. <laughs> good. That's, that's a really cool question. So, all right. Uh, little silver buttons or button batteries are another example of how wonderful <laughs> these things can be. Um, these actually create some silver, and I'm always surprised that people um, aren't trying to recycle them more, to be honest, because silver is usually pretty ex expensive. But anyway, you can see the reaction. You got zinc going to zinc 2 oxide. You have base being created, so this would be a basic uh, battery base, not a battery acid and stuff. Uh, but anyway, it's really cool, and obviously we use these a lot for different things. A mercury battery is very similar to an alkaline battery. In this case, zinc is oxidized to form zinc oxide, 
while mercury-2 oxide is reduced to form liquid mercury. Hydroxide ions are transported from the cathode region of the battery to the anode. Again, there's many different types of batteries. These actually create both mercury and base, all right? And that's not good for the environment. But again, I've been told that these have more potential, so they can power things a little easier. But again, don't be throwing these on the ground, man. It's bad. A 12-volt automobile battery is actually made of six cells connected in series. Each cell produces about two volts by the reduction of lead dioxide at the cathode and the oxidation of lead metal at the anode. This is a comproportionation reaction. The products of both the oxidation and reduction half reactions are lead to sulfate. This is an example, uh, first of all, but a, a battery that's an acid. So battery acid is absolutely legit. And with cars, definitely you're gonna have an acid uh, buildup if it's not done. But anyway, this is actually an example of a reversible reaction, which is why people use them in cars. Um, so here's the anode and the cathode coming together. Again, the anode is where the oxidation are. The anode, oxidation, the vowels go together. So oxidation means electrons are created. Cathode is reduction, so electrons are being taken in. So here's the two electrons being taken in to make lead to sulfate. And then here's the overall reaction. Now, each of the batteries is 2.04 volts. And for reasons which you'll talk about in physics, you can put them in series, all right? So instead of having just two volts, you might have you know six in a row, which would be about 12 volts. And again, now that's definitely more of a physics thing, but um, that's why you get extra voltage and stuff relative to one. But the nice thing is, is that these can be recharged, at least to a point, all right? This is a reversible reaction, which is cool. So in the process of the car, and again, I am not an engineer, and I don't, I can fill up my car with gas, and that's about it. Uh, in the process of it, you can recharge your battery so it lasts longer. But of course, batteries do die after a while. It doesn't last forever, but it lasts longer than it would have been otherwise. But again, Chi's question was really cool. This would be an example. Yeah, if you've got a terminal on your car, it's got some kind of crusty stuff, be super careful. This would be truly battery acid. Some of the other ones we showed would be battery base, but this one would be definitely some pretty strong acid, sulfuric acid even. In a rechargeable nickel cadmium battery, cadmium is oxidized at the anode to form cadmium hydroxide under alkaline conditions. The electrons are used at the cathode to reduce nickel from the plus three oxidation state to the plus two state. The products of each half reaction adhere to the electrode surfaces. Application of an external current to the battery can reverse the reactions, oxidizing the nickel back to the plus three state while reducing the cadmium hydroxide to metallic cadmium. The chemistry of this is always really fascinating to me. This NiOOH is actually a positive three nickel. Um, uh, hydroxide is usually negative one, and oxide is usually negative two. So negative two and negative one mean there's an overall negative three. So this is a nickel plus three. And nickel doesn't make plus three very often, so I'm always really fascinated by this reaction. But I have nickel cadmium batteries and stuff in some of my gear as well, so it's cool. This is another reversible reaction. They'll take the electricity from like hydroelectric dams at Bonneville or solar generated or wind power, et cetera, et cetera. And they can actually make the nickel two go back to nickel plus three. I guess it's not a very high threshold and stuff, so. Lithium batteries are used a lot. Um, lithium batteries are kind of a gold standard, as I understand, of different things. Again, some super wild chemistry. Here's the silver vanadium thing. Uh, I'm gonna allow it, I guess, that there's only five and a half oxygens instead of multiplying by two. No, 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 you know how you know what I'm thinking, so I'm not even gonna say it. But anyway, you get you see some really wild stuff. And again, the overall cell reaction, you've got silver, vanadium, and lithium coming together. Don't be thrown these away put them or at least throw them away in a proper place don't just throw them on the side of the ground so um, another example this one is a lithium manganese example you've got a little higher voltage which can be important for powering electronics stuff like that 
All right, hydrogen fuel cells are what people are talking about more and more. And hydrogen fuel cells are something that uh, hopefully are reversible. And the results at the end, you basically have just water. So in terms of cleanliness, heck yeah, no heavy metals, you know, the acid is used up and stuff, uh, and it's recycled essentially in the reaction, which is cool. So you do have a nice safe kind of thing, or at least safer, better for the environment. And that's why people get excited by hydrogen. Now you have to have a source of hydrogen. There's different things you can do. Um, a hydride is at H minus one. And some of the fuel systems for hydrogen use some kind of a hydride source to make the hydrogen. Then it goes into the anode and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm really interested in why so many different types of chemical reactions for batteries so you live at your place, all right? And maybe your place has a lot of lithium by it, all right? So you would naturally then work on lithium and make batteries there. But Kaylin lives at a different place, I'm sure. And so Kaylin might have a lot of nickel by her, all right? So she would develop those kind. So the different technologies, mostly as I, as I feel anyway, just develop on what's close to you. Then uh, the numbers that were there, the cell potentials were different. So if you have a low energy thing, like my remote control isn't very hard, all right? I don't need a lot of voltage. So maybe I could use the nickel, but not the silver. On the other hand, like a cell phone has a more heavy uh, voltage requirement. So there's different uses for different batteries and uh, boy, everybody wants them. So that's why there's so many different types. Car batteries are cool for cars, but they're big. You know, you can't, you know, oh, let me get on my cell phone. <laughs> and then the acid spills on you. And so it's different uses for different things. So could you technically make all those different batteries with the same type of chemical processes? At least intellectually, I don't see a problem with that. Now, there might be practical things, Chi, but, but at least from a ultimate standpoint, I think you could, yeah. So you could have like a cell phone with a lead battery. I, I could be wrong on that. It's not like I've done a lot of batteries. That's a good question. Um, in my world, I'm mostly interested in making the chemicals with electricity. And the cells that we've looked at so far have mostly been galvanic or voltaic. And that means product favored reactions. And that means your E naught value is positive. So you put them together, electrons start flowing. Electrolysis is more than just taking away your body hair. Darn it. Now, electrolysis means you're going to add electricity to make a chemical reaction happen. And this is an example of how tin is made. I, I don't think they use it for chlorine, but I could be wrong. Tin 2 plus and two chlorides can be combined to make tin metal and chlorine gas. Now, if you do this and you figure out the cell potential, it won't be a positive number. You'll have a negative number. And a negative number means you put everything together, it's not going to happen by itself. But if you plug in some kind of external voltage source, then the reaction will become product favorite. You can make it happen. So we're using the product favored reaction of say Bonneville Dam or a windmill to make these kind of chemicals happen. So this is kind of a cool thing. Um, redox reactions are usually high efficiency. So your percent yield in making tin metal, which is what this is from tin 2 chloride, it's probably gonna be pretty high. Um, chlorine would be harder to collect here, but if we could collect it, it'd probably be higher. Um, this is just an example of a reaction um, that's kind of cool. Now, copper 2 plus and tin metal will by default make copper metal and tin 2 plus. And I know that because the cell potential is a positive number, 0.48 volts. An electrolytic cell is basically the opposite, all right? So instead of having copper 2 plus and tin react, now we're gonna have tin 2 plus and copper react, and it's gonna make tin metal and copper 2 plus. Now, this cell potential is negative. And again, you want this to happen? It's not gonna happen this way, all right? Negative E cells imply if this is negative, it makes delta G positive. Positive delta Gs are thumbs down from the thermodynamic deities. However, if you apply 0.48 volts from a 
from the um, tap or something like that, uh, then you can actually make these kind of things happen, which is kind of cool. So you need external sources of energy for an electrolytic cell. And a lot of the chemicals that we've used even in Chem 221 to Chem 223 have been made with these kind of processes. Um, here's just some examples. This will be an electrolytic cell. Uh, it's going to make, I think this is uh, breaking down water to hydrogen and oxygen. It doesn't happen by default, which is good. You drink water, you don't want to burp up hydrogen and oxygen or something, or catch on fire or whatever. But um, on the other hand, if you apply electricity, i.e. connect it to a battery, then you're going to start making things happen. So in this reaction, they're starting with, looks like a base, and they're making oxygen and water. And on the cathode then, and by the way, look at these negative numbers. So these are not things that will happen by default. The water is going to break down to hydrogen and hydroxide. The decomposition of water is thermodynamically disfavored, but can be made to occur by electrolysis, the application of an external electric current. Here, platinum electrodes transfer electrons between two cell compartments to separate the decomposition products. Gaseous oxygen rises from the anode at the left, hydrogen from the cathode at the right. So a negative cell potential means that that reaction is not going to happen by default. All right, water is not going to break down to hydrogen and oxygen if you combine these two reactions together. However, if you apply positive 1.23 volts or so, then you will start seeing water breaking down. And it's kind of neat, like in one side, there was more uh, volume of gas than the other side. That's because two moles of hydrogen gas are made on that side and only one mole of oxygen is made on the other. Each mole of gas is about 22.4 liters of volume, if you remember from Chem 222. So two moles should be about twice as much as oxygen. That's why there's more on this side than that side. So this will be the hydrogen and that'll be the oxygen. So it's kind of neat to do these kind of things as a chemist. You can uh, make things that are quote unquote impossible happen. They're not really impossible. You're just adding a source of uh, energy that's something that's happened to make something that's quote unquote hard to do more likely. Um, making sodium metal is a great example of this. Now sodium metal is not found anywhere in nature, all right? The sodium ions are all over the place, all right? Table salt, sodium hydroxide, sodium carbonate, these kind of things. But you're not going to have sodium metal anywhere. It's so reactive. However, if you take sodium chloride and you melt it, which is again about 800 degrees Celsius, that's not a, something we can do here easily in the lab, and you add some electricity, then the electrons will be pumped from the chloride to the sodium ions, which is just crazy. So again, melting sodium chloride is not easy, 800 degrees Celsius plus, and you need it in the liquid form because you've got to get those electrons flowing. Excuse me. The battery then will essentially make the chloride give up electrons and they'll go to the sodium ions to make sodium metal. And this is how all the alkali metals are made that are pure. Sodium metal, potassium metal, lithium metal, all those kind of things. They just don't exist in nature, but humanity has found a way to make them, which is fun for throwing it in water and watching it explode and stuff. But uh, anyway. So, if you want to break down what's actually happening here, chloride going to chlorine, very uh, non-spontaneous, i.e. a very negative number. Positive E's are spontaneous because positive E's mean negative delta G's. But boy, chloride going to chlorine, no way. Since Chem 221, we've talked about how chlorine likes to become chloride, all right? But this, in this problem, we're doing the opposite. But even more than chloride going to chlorine, sodium ions going to sodium, super unlikely, negative 2.71, even less spontaneous, even more non-spontaneous than chloride was. So you have to pump in a lot of energy to make this happen, all right? 4.07 volts would be needed. But in the process, then, yeah, you'll end up with sodium metal. The chlorine is a gas that you can collect in a container. It's amazing. 
oh, I've got safe table salt at home. I'll just plug my electrics, electrons in there. Ah, here's the problem. So in the last example, we were using molten sodium chloride. So taking literally sodium chloride, table salt, heating it to 800 degrees, turning it into a liquid, and then doing it. If you use table salt in water, you would initially think that something else would happen. But the problem is, you do, if you end up adding voltage, chloride goes to chlorine, just like before, no problem. But the sodium doesn't happen because water starts to break down before sodium ions make sodium metal. So if you have just aqueous sodium chloride, which would be easier, of course, you wouldn't have to heat it up to 800 degrees, you won't end up with sodium metal, all right? You're going to end up with some hydroxide, some hydrogen gas, and chlorine, and maybe that's what you want, but you won't get the sodium metal. You've got to use the truly molten sodium chloride to make that kind of happen. You're seeing that there's competing pathways here, so it's a different kind of a story. So chloride is oxidized in preference. Oh, that's right, chloride is also in preference to water because of kinetics. Chloride is a little easier to make it happen. Um, this is an old picture, kind of lame and stuff like that, but this is a way that they actually have these huge reservoirs in order to make things like sodium hydroxide, like chlorine, um, hypochlorite, a source of hypochlorite, sodium hypochlorite, which is used in bleach, is made this way. So again, all of these chemicals are things that they use electricity for, electrolysis. Um, you make sodium hydroxide the best way, it's usually with electrolysis. Chlorine gas, definitely. Hypochlorite in bleach, as well as my beloved sodium metal, potassium metal, stuff like that. Um, this guy's kind of interesting, Charles Hall. Uh, Hall went up to his chemistry instructor, apparently, and said, how can I make a lot of money? <laughs> All right. Uh, so anyway, the chemistry instructor said, well, if you can make aluminum metal, that would be really cool. And as an example of why that's cool, apparently Napoleon, uh, this is the early 1800s, used to serve his fancy guests on aluminum things. And now today we kind of poo-poo aluminum because it's so it's so easy to get. But at the time, having pure aluminum was very rare. So it's like having it on gold plates or something. Well, uh, once Hall came around, him and a couple other people uh, found a way to take aluminum oxide and they added essentially a source of graphite and they were able to make pure aluminum metal. And that had huge implications for the industry. So airplanes used to be made, for example, of wood in World War I, but by World War II, most of them were using aluminum. It's a light metal and stuff like that that can be used. And of course, aluminum's used in aluminum cans and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, Charles Hall became quite rich. He's one of the people that helped founded Alcoa, which was a precursor of some of the aluminum generating plants. Um, supposedly the Reynolds place here in uh, Oregon that used to make aluminum metal, uh, they were some kind of offshoot at Alcoa, and I, I don't know all the historical details, but anyway. In case you're curious, if anybody asks me how to make money, I would say go into catalysis, make some catalysts. Catalysts are huge money. You make the right catalyst and woo -hoo! But of course, I work at a community college, so you should take everything I say with a grain of salt. But <laughs> anyway, questions on... Okay, that's really it for this chapter. Um, next week, Monday, again, no class. Next week, Monday morning, I'll send you an email link to Quiz 5. Print it out, bring quiz five Wednesday morning, nine o'clock. You have to be in lecture on Wednesday if you're gonna turn your quiz in, all right? Uh, Wednesday of lecture, we will review for the second midterm, and then uh, maybe Friday, I haven't decided yet, and then we'll start the last chapter after that. We're almost through. Have a good day. <laughs>